Hi everyone, welcome to FIBA America's virtual coaching clinic offered to the national federations. It includes 12 clinics every Thursday at 6 p.m. Miami time in English or in Spanish. At the end of the clinic, you'll have a chance to ask coach questions. Please have yourselves on mute and hold the questions until the end. The video will also be recorded so that you can replay it at any time in the future. We would like to thank WABC, which is short for World Association of Basketball Coaches for their support. Today in our third session, of our 12-week seminar, we will be joined um, by Jennifer Rosati, um, the head coach at GW. Uh, but before we introduce her, um, I would like to introduce Carol Callen, the president of FIBA Americas. Carol, take it away. Thanks, Grady. I'd like to welcome Jen as well and welcome all of you as participating coaches in this clinic. Uh, Jen has been a, a long time a contributor to USA Basketball as a member of uh, the committees that select the players and coaches. She also is the head coach of uh, the junior national team. She is currently an assistant coach for the Olympic team for next year's Olympic Games. But I think you will find as you listen to her, uh, she has a, a, a great way about her, a, a good sense of humor. Uh, you'll find the competitive point guard mentality that she has uh, and you'll find that she um, brings a, a real good knowledge of basketball to the game. So Jen, thank you. Welcome. And I'd like to turn this over to Carlos Alves, the secretary or the executive director of FIBA Americas. Thanks, Carlos. Yes. Thank you, Carol. Uh, thank you, Grady. And uh, thank you, Coach Jennifer, for joining us. It's a, it's a pleasure. Greetings to everyone from Miami. Um, this is, I'll, I will be super short, but this is, uh, I think, the sixth or seventh uh, webinar that we put together. And there's a reason behind this. The reason is uh, one of the strategic pillars for FIBA globally is to develop women in basketball as well as develop our national federations. So what else or what better then bring uh, people like Jennifer to, to guide us and in, in lead us uh, in terms of development. So once again, it's an honor for FIBA to have you, Jennifer. I'll go back to Grady and have fun, everybody. Thank you. Um, so I'm super excited to introduce Jennifer Rosati. She's going into her fifth season as head coach at the George Washington University. And she's currently an assistant coach for the US Women's National Team for the upcoming 2020, 2021 Olympic Games in Tokyo. Prior to becoming the head coach at GW, she coached 17 seasons at the University of Hartford, where she helped build a conference powerhouse and led the Hawks to all six NCAA appearances in program history. Rosati's international basketball involvement is extensive. In 2010, she served as the head coach of FIBA America's U18 gold medal winners, as well as the 2011 U19 world champions. She was named USA Basketball National Coach of the Year in 2011. More recently, Rosati served as an assistant to the 2014 and 2018 FIBA World Championships and served in a supportive role for the USA Women's National Team in 2016. But before she became a coach, Rosati was a student athlete at UConn. As a starting point guard, she helped lead the team to their first national championship in 1995. After graduating, she played eight seasons professionally. She was a member of the WNBA's first dynasty, the Houston Comets, where she won two championships. Her involvement and commitment to USA basketball is remarkable. And I'm super excited to have her with us today. Let's welcome Jennifer Rosati. Okay, well, thank you very much, Grady. I appreciate the great introduction. And thank you to Carol. Um, I, I'm very privileged to have the opportunity to have worked with USA Basketball now for over 10 years, um, starting as an assistant coach on one of their youth teams back in 2006. Um, and it's been a, a, a fun ride ever since. Um, I think the, the international game has taught me so much um, in the course of my coaching career. Um, I've been privileged to work with some of the best players in the world um, in terms it, with USA Basketball. Um, and I, I'm honored to be able to, to say that I'm going to work with the team in the 2021 Olympics, which we were hoping was going to be a month from now. Um, so I, I really want to thank um, Carlos and Paolo and uh, Jonathan, who helped set this up, um, for inviting me to be a part of the clinics today. 
Um, I think that uh, over the course of my career, I've learned so much about how uh, sharing and networking and um, encouraging each other through our profession um, is really, really important on the women's side of basketball. And as I stated earlier, I think being a part of uh, USA Basketball coaching staffs and scouting for the 2016 Olympics, uh, I've learned a lot about how the game um, should be played. Um, so I feel very privileged to have learned a lot from probably many of you out there listening and your uh, federations and your countries um, about the beauty of women's basketball and the flow of, of women's basketball. And I have certainly enjoyed over my time um, coaching, uh, watching these phenomenal athletes from all over the world. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm proud that I'm part of um, USA Basketball. And uh, I know that there has been some dominance on the women's side. Um, but I think that we've learned a lot from um, other coaches around the world about how to be better in our own game. So thank you guys for joining us tonight. Um, you know, this, this is a privilege for me to have a chance to, to be on here. I know that we all probably prefer to do in-person clinics, um, but it's great in this time of the pandemic that so many coaches are willing to uh, spend time sharing. Uh, that's how we get better. And at, you know, at the end of the day, our goal is to be great in women's basketball around the world. Uh, when you watch the competition, uh, when we see foreign players come over playing in the WNBA, uh, it makes us proud to think about the ambassadors we have in our game. Um, so I'm really excited to be a part of this. I've watched some of the clinics. I've already learned from you all. And uh, I'm happy to be able to share uh, some of my thoughts tonight. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. Um, tonight, my, the topic of my presentation was, ta was to talk a little bit about, um, you know, the quick hits that we run out of our Princeton offense at GW. Um, one of the things that I've learned uh, in my time co coaching internationally is that six seconds on the shot clock makes a big difference uh, uh, for American basketball. But uh, one of my goals for us is, uh, as, as a program is to make sure that we're playing a little bit faster next year. We want to play more like the international style. So I want to make sure my offense fits that. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here for you. Okay. so. Um, so like I said, my presentation topic was quick hits in the Princeton offense. And I think a couple of things that I wanted to share with you as I got going is the reason that we put this in for our team is, is to be able to take advantage of the versatility that we have at a, at a mid-major program. So we don't necessarily have like six, four, six, five post players. Um, so I would love to play a little bit more like the international style and have five guard-like uh, players that can play both on the perimeter um, and at the basket. Um, th th this offense requires, you know, a high IQ, great spacing. Um, we really talk to our team a lot about cutting, passing, and screening uh, being important in the offense. And the great thing about it is it provides an opportunity for us to be difficult to scout. So instead of being a team that has a bunch of plays, we want to be able to um, implement an offense that's very free-flowing, that promotes versatility and creativity, and, and really allows our players to think the game. Um, so for us, we have kind of our own play calls within the offense, um, but we're working really hard to get to the point where we don't have to call plays um, and to understand kind of what structure they need from you. And that's the beauty of it is you can kind of build it however you need it for your team. So we try and make sure that we utilize the reps and we build and rep the options that we feel like will work the best for us. Um, so as many of you guys know, um, Typically, the Princeton offense starts as a 2-3 um, high set. So everybody is, is set up um, above the free throw line. Uh, and you can put guys in your offense wherever you feel like they fit the best. But again, we, we like to have the versatility of being able to have all of our players, one through four, uh, very interchangeable, and even three, four, and five being able to exchange in the positions that they play. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to show kind of a couple sets um, off of the paper. And then I'm going to show a video where we took advantage of that option so you guys can get a sense of it. If there's an option that you want to talk about later when we open it up for Q&A, just kind of write down what that option is and I'll be able to answer your questions. Um, but our, our, our foundational pattern is, you know, dribble handoff on the wing, dribble up, pass it across, and really try and take advantage of the first screen in our offense. And this is where we try and emphasize guys being great screeners for us. 
Um, so if you, if you watch our team here, and, and I apologize if it's a little choppy, um, but you'll see as we hand it off, um, we dribble up and then we hit our cutter off of the back screen. Um, let me see if I can move, yeah, there we go. So we hand it off here, we pass across, we set a great screen at the free throw line, and we hit our guy off the back screen. Um, so again, that's like the first option in our offense that we try and drill. Um, it's important that our guys are able to read that screen well, and then make sure that they do a good job of cutting and passing. Um, these first two options are really dictated by our ability to reverse the ball quickly. Um, so even in our second option, if we don't hit our cutter off of the back screen, we try and play off our secondary option, which is our flare screen. Um, and so you'll see here that as our guys hand it off, they fill, we reverse it to the three. Um, we cut off, our first option is look for our cutter. And then if we don't have our cutter, our second cut is the flare screen, which we score on from the top of the key. And that can be a shot or it can be a, 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 a drive. Um, and so if you look at these options here, you'll see off of the video, you'll see we dribble handoff, pass across. We don't get our first option, but right here, we get the guy off the flare for a drive to the basket. So again, allows us to use the versatility of our players in this offense. It's dribble handoff. So these are quick options for us that we're trying to take advantage of in the first you know, 10 to 12 seconds of our, our offense. You know, if we don't get the shot off of the flare screen or the shot off of a drive, we love to come into this action where we dribble handoff and we continue the action on the weak side of the floor. And you'll see here, uh, we get into a ball screen with our five player. So we use the flare, we hand it off, we come off of a ball screen, and then we look for that back, you know, back pass into a high-low action for our post player. So there is opportunities in this offense to be able to make sure that we're utilizing our five players uh, within the offense and off of ball screens. You know, the, the biggest thing for us is making sure our players understand um, what happens when options are taken away from them. So if we can't dribble handoff, if we can't pass the ball across the shoot, if we can't reverse the ball to the wing, we have other options or other play calls that we can get into so that our players don't stop playing. Um, and so in this offense, we typically probably play more off of the elbow action, which is where I really love because it provides us with post up our four player, because typically in our league, we can, we, we have more favorable matchups in the post with our fours and our threes than we do sometimes with our five players. And so when we can't pass, reverse the ball all the way around the, the floor to the wing, um, we typically ask our players to play off of the elbow. Um, so the next couple options are us playing off the elbow, and we have different calls for this. Um, so in this first option, we call it post, and you'll see that we'll pass the ball to the five, we'll screen away and back cut our four and look for them on the post up. If we don't get them when they're – on the block, then we'll immediately flow into a five to three ball screen and get the roll rise opportunity. So as the five ball screens and rolls in, the four makes make sure that they come back out to the perimeter to provide a high-low opportunity. And we're constantly looking for high-low opportunities for our post players. So you can see off of this option here, we don't reverse the ball. We play off of our five player at the elbow and we look to hit our four player cutting. And for us, our four player is our best cutter. So we get a lot of action when we play off of the elbow here for her. This time she curls to the basket. We, go, we flow right into a ball screen and right into a high low opportunity from our four player passing it into our five. So this gives us some really good flow to our offense. We also can play off of the elbow without initiating. So that for teams that like to pressure us, we try and play with an initial pass off the elbow so that our players feel like they have the freedom to play two man on the weak side, to drive from any position on the floor. And at any point in the offense, they have the ability for us to go, to go into a ball screen. Um, and so that's really important for us is that they don't get stuck. If something's taken away, they have another option. 
Um, so off of the elbow, again, like I said, we'll initiate it with a dribble handoff. We'll also just initiate it with a, a back screen right into to a pass to the elbow for, for you know, kind of less uh, – for teams that like to pressure us, it's less of an opportunity for them to pick off a pass. Uh, as, as I said earlier, we also have uh, really good four players in our team that are great on the block and the perimeter, which I think is very common in the international game. Um, so we like to have ISO opportunities for our four players uh, to post up. And so when we run our Princeton offense and we really want to take advantage of a four player in our offense, um, we, we typically tell our team to look, look for the opportunities where uh, Miowa, who's our four player, is dribbling the ball up the floor and coming off of the back screen. So as we reverse the ball to our four in the offense and she dribbles up the floor and passes it across on the second option, when she comes off of the five player back screen, instead of vacating the floor to create spacing, we ask her to stay in there and post up. So again, this is an option where we'll play off of our five player at the elbow, but instead of screening away, our five will turn around and look directly into the post to try and take advantage of a matchup. So this is a little bit more clear. We'll dribble, we'll pass it across. We'll dribble to our four player. When she passes, she comes off of the uh, five player screen and then she turns and posts up immediately. So I have some pretty good examples of this. And this was a um, option in our offense that we tried to utilize a lot because our, one of our leading scorers was our four. So you'll see it here. In this case, it's Neela. She's coming off of the back screen. And then right in this instance, instead of vacating the paint, she turns and posts up. And so again, because our guards are moving on the perimeter, because our five player is our passer, it really gives us a great opportunity to isolate the matchup that we want in the paint. And you can put anyone in this position. So if you love a certain matchup with your three player or your four player or your two player, you can get them down on the block and you can immediately put them right into a, a ISO post situation. Uh, I think a lot of the action that I really loved in international game and even with USA basketball is played off the elbow, which is why we have a lot of options off the elbow. So in addition to using our five player to play with our um, four player, we also like to utilize our five player at the elbow to play with our other guard. And this is action that I see a lot professionally. Uh, we call this strong. So as we get into our offense and we pass across and vacate the lane and we utilize our five with a pass. Now we're going to play on our strong side with our one and our three player. Um, so this is kind of, this is where you need players that have creativity and have the ability to think the game for themselves. And what we also want on the weak side is to be able to space the floor with a, a, a stretch four and a two player that can shoot because after the initial action on the strong side, we typically like to reverse the ball so we can get, a three-pointer for our two-player, or we can get a post-up once again for our four. And so our initial action is to play with our one and three. As the three-player and the one-player are coming together to screen, you can do slips, you can do curls, you can utilize the screen, um, or our five-player can decide to go to the weak side, and this is where we'll have our, our four-player down screen for the two and have an opportunity for a three-point shot. So here's an example of our strong action. So as we dribble up, we'll hit a cross. This time we waited to go second time through, but you can see here as we come across, we have guard to guard screens. We, this time we go into a handoff for one of our players to take a, sh a shot off the ball screen. So again, we hit our five at the elbow, we come and screen, we look for the slip right into a ball screen action, and we hit the roller. So again, we, we like to utilize our five players on the move instead of posting them up. So they have a lot of opportunities in our offense to either hand it off or utilize a ball screen so they can get themselves back into the basket. So it's, it's a good offense if you have a mobile five player, which a lot of international teams do, a lot of mid-majors teams do. And it's even becoming more popular at the high major level where you have four guards on the floor 
and a very mobile post player. Um, the, the next option, this is just, again, if you're, if you're looking to score quickly in this offense, um, having the ability to get into two-man action uh, often. Um, and so we like to have our two and our five. So we try and put our scoring guard in this position a lot where she can hit our five, come off of a ball screen. She can hit our five and come off for a handoff. And she's playing two man in the middle of the floor. And of all my time in international basketball, I have noticed that guarding ball screens in the middle of the floor is the hardest place to guard. And so in my offense at GW, I'm really trying to incorporate more ball screens and handoffs in the middle of the floor because I know it creates problems for where the help comes from. So in this action, um, we'll typically see uh, one of our, our leading guard scorers um, come up. And as we back screen and utilize our five player, she'll come right off for dribble handoff. So she creates the mismatch um, in the middle of the floor. They switch, which a lot of times people will do in the middle of the floor. And then she has the ability to take the post player to the basket. So in addition, very similarly, as she gets the ball at the top of the key and we set that back screen, we'll go right into what we call fist, which is just a high ball screen in the middle of the floor. So again, our two player will end up with the ball right outside the shoot. As we go off the back screen, she's going to then turn and come right off of a ball screen. And this was another play that ended up being very effective for us late in the year as we had two of our leading scorers involved in a lot of the action. So you'll see, you'll see here, and sometimes we run our offense twice through just to kind of, you know, force the defense to really have to guard us. But right here, again, same player, right into a ball screen in the middle of the floor. We'll get into high, this, this opportunity, we got into a high-low uh, situation with our four player, but it really gives uh, Sydney, in this case, that freedom and that opportunity to make plays off of the high ball screen. So, you know, I think the big thing for, the, for this offense is, is making sure that, like anything that you do in basketball, that you're building habits. And one of the things that we talk a lot about in, um, you know, our coaches meetings is how do we implement our offense and the things that are important to us into our practice setting. And so we do a lot of breakdowns. So if you want to be good at the mid ball screen, you want to be good at the three man strong action, you want to be good at two man on the wing, um, you, you got to work on it a lot. Um, and so for us, we work on this parts of our offense every day. And the beauty of this offense is there's a, there's a lot of options. So sometimes it can be overwhelming with how much we need to work on it. But we utilize time before practice, in practice, and in our position breakdowns to get our players comfortable in the areas where we want them to score. Um, I think every team wants to play in transition. I mean, that is definitely, at least I know for me in the off season, it's the videos that I've watched the most is how to be effective in transition offense. And so it's an area where I would like to be better as a coach, but I also feel like as the season wears on, we end up seeing a lot of half court execution. And the teams that can defend and execute in the half court, in addition to scoring in trans transition late in the year, are the ones that are the most successful. And my best year so far at GW, we had a team where we had a lot of versatility. We were able to move players into different positions. And we were able to take advantage of all of the different options in the, in the Princeton offense um, to utilize our players where they were at their best. Um, at, and that year, our best post-up player was our three. And so we had a lot of options where we could get her down on the block. We had a great three-point shooting post player. So we were able to move them around the floor because of the freedom and the creativity of the offense to create scoring opportunities. Um, so these are habits that we work on every day. Um, we try and tape the floor to give them a sense of where we want them to start, where we want our handoffs to happen, um, how high up the floor we want them to initiate their cuts. Um, and, and essentially what we want the spacing to be, because I do think in any offense, when you have five players, the spacing that you create when you're trying to play in two man and three man games is the, really more important than anything else you're doing. Um, we try and make sure we're doing a lot of five on O where we're calling out different options or we'll throw in 
um, a defender or two to deny a pass so that our players are thinking as they're playing. Um, they, we don't want them to be robotic. We want them to know as they turn to make a pass, if that pass is denied, that they have another option. Um, we also like to give them a lot of snapshots of like, hey, this is, this is the action you're going to see in circle post or in um, circle four or whatever we're calling our offense. We try and give them those snapshots of, of building up from two on O to three on O and then adding defense so that essentially the screening and the cutting and the reading of the defense becomes the most important part of your offense. Um, and then we just make sure we're constantly talking about the details. Um, so whether the screening angle uh, is supposed to be one direction or our cuts need to be in a certain area, uh, how quickly we pass the ball uh, around the perimeter to the outside hand, and then most importantly, the reads that you make in the offense. So we try and explain to our team that there is no right or wrong um, read. It's, it's essentially what is the defense giving you that will dictate the op option. And so we just init you know, initially put this offense in um, primarily last year. Um, we did utilize it in my first couple of years, but last year we used it primarily in our half court sets. And it took us a good half a year before our players understood the reads in the offense. So I'm really looking forward to having another season where our players are already comfortable in the options, they're comfortable in their reads, and we can start to elevate um, the options that we put in to take advantage of certain matchups. But I really enjoy the fact that we can, you know, we can be in a situation where if we love a point guard, if we want to take advantage of a point guard in a ball screen, if we want to take advantage of a post player in a back screen, if we want certain uh, two-man action on the left side of the floor, every single option within the Princeton off offense will give us the ability to do that. And so even when we recruit, we talk to kids about recruiting versatility and recruiting uh, to, the, to the, their strengths. Like this is where you're going to be successful, whether it's on the block, uh, at the elbow. We, we work a lot on uh, rips at the elbow for our five players, um, on the perimeter as a shooter, uh, and then obviously cutting to the basket. I mean, every coach wants a layup whenever, primarily whenever we can get it. So uh, our, our focus is for next year will be on transition basketball and then how many layups we can get in our offense because of our spacing because of our cutting um, and because we're really difficult to guard at every position um, so I am going to come on out of this slideshow here I feel like I zoomed through that a little bit because I wasn't sure um, how long it would take um, so I'm happy to go back through um, any options that you guys um, want to talk about um, and I'm also, I'm, I'm also happy to talk about philosophies in general um, when it comes to what we're doing in our half-court offense, but also what we do on a daily basis in practice. All right. Thank you, Coach. Um, so we actually have a few questions already, right. and one of them is from Ray Emanuels. He says, can you break down the best option out of the Princeton offense against a two to three zone defense? Yes, I can, actually. I probably should have put that on the film. So the great thing, the probably the mo my most favorite thing that I like about the Princeton offense is the ability to play, to run it against the zone or man. Um, and so the the best option that we like, and um, I'm actually going to go back to the presentation here, if that's okay with you guys. Um, can you guys see it? Yeah, can you guys see the uh, yeah. Grady? Can you guys see the presentation again? Yes. Okay. Um, and so when, when, we, when we get to where we're playing against the zone, what I love about this offense is that you can, you can as long as you can get the ball to the high post, this offense is really, really good. Um, and so when we get to our second option here where we play off of the flare, um, we will ask our players to run through this offense. And when we get to the point where our four player is cutting through um, and we don't hit them, you know, and we're, we're, we're now we're, we're, we have the ball on the wing in our three position and our five player is looking to flare for our one. So this is like the, this option down here in the fourth box. We typically against the zone, we don't screen. So we will ask our players to cut and fill. And so instead of our five players screening, flare screening for our one, 
we'll have them cut just below the elbow and we'll have our one player fade to the top of the key. And so what this will do is provide us with an opportunity to hit our five just below the elbow, you know, so below the top of the zone. And then when the middle of the zone, the two, three zone comes up to guard the five, we will then cut our four player right to the basket. And so if we don't get that high, low opportunity, five to four, the five players respons responsible now for turning and looking to skip it for the two players. So we'll have our two player fade down to the corner. And so they'll be in a position where they can knock down a shot. Um, so we, we like to use this like continuing pattern without the screens. So it's dribble handoff, pass across, our first player cuts, and then as the five is, is, is supposed to flare for the one, we will have them cut into the elbow area or just below the elbow, kind of mid post area in order to look for that high low opportunity. And so we love this because it puts us in a position where we get, we, we don't have to call a zone offense. We can disguise it and we can still get into a high low opportunity, which is very effective against most zones. Okay. Uh, we have another question from uh, someone named Renan. Out of the Princeton offense, what is a good option for a quick hitter um, after uh, to get an open three? To get an open three? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so the initial flare screen that we set um, is definitely provided a lot of opportunities for us to get threes. Um, we also get a lot of three pointers off of ball screen throwbacks. And so, if you if you can isolate uh, in that fifth option where our, our two player is um, coming off of that middle ball screen. Um, and so as your five players roll into the basket, if you can get a four, a four or a two player that fills behind, we get a ton of three pointers off of rises in our off ball screen offense. Um, and so I, I, we, we get them off of the flares and we can get them off of, um, you know, the handoff opportunities in the two man game but we probably get most of our threes off of ball screen roll rise. What's your approach to building communication within your team, such as do you require them to be vocal on both ends of the court, you know, in practices, in games? Yes, I mean, I think most coaches dream is to have a very vocal basketball team. I mean, that's like what every one of us strives to have. And so it's something that you have to build into everything that you do from the, from the minute they walk into the gym and how they're vocal during their stretching, how they're vocal during their warmups. Um, and I think sometimes depending on the team, it's teaching them how to be vocal. What should they be saying and how should they say it? Um, how do you be proactive in your communication instead of reactive? Um, but in order for our offense and defense to work effectively, uh, it's definitely imperative that you're constantly stressing communication with your team. Um, so many players come out of high school and they are not challenged to be vocal. And so you can't let, allow them to use that as an excuse. Um, you have to be in a situation as kids are young where you teach them to be vocal and then you hold them accountable for it as they go through. And obviously we expect our older players to be the most vocal players on our team, but we don't let our freshmen and sophomores off the hook either. Now you said you, you know, you aspire to run a more international offense, you know, quicker yes. pace as your team is a little smaller than, than some at times. Yeah. Um, how do you, how do you work the rotation? Um, are people just always ready to, are you, are you subbing in and out? Like how often are you subbing in and out um, and what does that look like for your team? Yeah, I, actually this year we subbed a lot, um, you know, and, and again, in my time, you know, fortunately in, in USA basketball opportunities, we've, you know, been blessed with, you know, 12, usually 12 really, really good players. So you want to play them all. You want to have them on the court. And so you typically have a starting five and then, you know, you're fortunate to have another five players off the bench that can come in and be, um, very effective for you and wear other teams down. And that's something that I worked on with my team this year a lot was to find a first five and a second five so that we, at times we could sub in two or three at a time, but we also at times were subbing in five at a time so that we could play a little bit faster. We could pick up a little bit more full um, and that we could, you know, probably produce a little bit better because we were less tired. 
Um, so even though our, the Princeton offense is definitely more something that we utilize in the half court, we definitely got better at, at being able to give that next group that was going in the options that we wanted to run out of transition. Um, and so even if you want to have a rim runner, you can, you can send that five player to the rim. And then if you don't have that opportunity to go into a ball screen or a post up, you can dribble handoff, you can rise the five and you can be right into those Princeton offense options within four or five seconds of your offense. Now, can you tell us a little bit about the adjustment you go through as you're, you know, you're a head coach at GW and yeah. then you're an assistant coach for the USA team, which is a huge um, responsibility. Yeah. Can you tell us what that adjustment is like for you and kind of, you know, allowing Don to, to be that, you know, that head coach? Yeah. Well, I think the, you know, the benefit for me is the two national teams that I worked with um, so far. One was coached by Gino Ariema, who was my coach in college. Um, and, and then the second one now is being coached by Dawn. So we're talking about two of the very best in the women's game in the United States right now. And the advantages that Dawn has as a former Olympian, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's understated. Like she's, somebody that has been in their shoes um she understands the difficulty um as as people around the united states at least think that it's what we do is easy because there might be a big disparity in the scoring um dawn understands how hard it is um and how hard the american players work to be dominant in the international game um, she understands the competition level she understands that we can't take anybody for granted, that any team in the world can beat us on an off night. Um, and so she knows how to motivate our players to rise to the occasion. You know, every practice and every game, um, every preparation, we, we, we take everybody as seriously from the very first game in pool play all the way down to the gold medal game. We don't change our preparation. Um, we take everybody seriously because we know the high level of competition and we know how much better every country in the world is getting in women's yes, basketball. Up with one. Um, so it's, it's a privilege for me to, to learn from the best. Um, I trust them. Um, I want to help them win a gold medal. You know, I think that it's like imperative that Dawn has assistant coaches on her staff that she can trust in terms of scouting and pr preparing our team uh, for the competition that we're about to face. Um, so it's nice to have had the opportunity to work with her as a scout and she was an assistant in the, in the Rio Olympics. And then now as her assistant in the Tokyo Olympics, uh, I feel like we've had a really good relationship and a really good flow. Um, and she just makes us all really proud uh, in how she handles herself and how she motivates and what she stands for. And, um, you know, I, I feel like it's a, it's a really big honor to be working by her side. Now, the, the American women, they've been dominant in FIBA and Olympic tournaments. What do you think are the three strengths of the American teams over the rest of the world? Well, I would definitely say depth. You know, again, we've got, we got players that are left off the team that are good enough to be Olympians, you know, and I think that that's a, a luxury that we don't take for granted. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a tough process to, be, to pick the Olympic team and not because it's not the best 12 players in the world. It's the best complement of players and it's the best mix of players. And you have to look at positions and you have to look at matchups. Um, but I think that um, the depth that we have one through 12 is unique. Um, I also think that our size, um, we, we may not, we may face teams that have size like us, but not everybody does. We may face teams that has, have athleticism like us, but not everybody does. So we have the versatility to play small, to play fast, to bang if we need to, and to be big if we need to. And that's where I think our biggest strength lies is that you know we're deep and we have the versatility to play the way that we want. And then lastly, we have a uh, multi-year, you know, multi, <laughs> Olympians, uh, I, I don't really know how to say that because it's not year, but mm -hmm. Olympians that have played over and over again that value being a part of um, the USA basketball culture and that teach that culture down to, the, to every single player that comes into the national team pool. So the, Carol, you know, Carol Callen has done such a great job of the, the continuation of talent. 
you know, and adding players into the mix consistent, consistently enough where there is not a drop off on any given year, any given Olympics, because you have players that have had four Olympics, you have players on the team that are in their second Olympics, you have players that are experiencing it for the first time. So having a large national team pool is a luxury for us. And so that continuation of, of commitment um, and doing things the right way, the USA basketball way is definitely one of our strengths. Now, looking forward to 2021 in Tokyo, um, what, what most are you looking forward to about, you know, that experience? Mm -hmm. I don't know if I could come up with one thing, to be honest with you. Um, I actually spent four years of my youth in Tokyo um, from sixth grade to ninth grade. Uh, my dad worked for a company that um, trans transitioned him to Japan. And so I, I lived there for four years. And so I always thought like it would be pretty cool if my, if my return to Tokyo was for the Olympics, yeah. because I, I really appreciate uh, my time there my development as a young woman and, and a basketball player. I had great experiences in athletics in Japan. Um, and so I'm looking forward to returning and, and seeing what it's become. The last time I've been there was 1996, so it's been a while. Um, I look forward to this team. I got to know them really well over the course of my time as a scout in 2014 and 16. Um, and many of the players will be returning and I built relationships with them. Um, and I look forward to, like I said earlier, um, you know, Dawn will be one of the only, I think the only player and coach to have a gold medal, you know, in an Olympics. And that's pretty cool. And I would love to help her do that. And I just look forward to being a part of it, representing our country. Um, Car Carol and Jim Tooley have done a phenomenal job of making USA basketball into something really, really special that we all want to be a part of. And the relationships and the gr personal growth um, and my, my professional growth as a coach, um, all those things come into play when I have the opportunity to travel with them. Now you, as we know, you have an extensive history with USA basketball. Um, what's your favorite memory? Oh Lord. Um, I don't know. I don't know if I have one favorite memory. Um, you know, I was the head coach for the U19, um, uh, team in 2011. And I remember, <laughs> Uh, you know, 2018 was, uh, you know, the FIBA Americas and we, it was hosted in Colorado Springs. So we're playing at home and, you know, we didn't have a whole lot of competition. And I remember Carol saying to me, Jen, the, the, the U19 world championship is, is no joke. She's like, it might be the hardest world championship for us to win in the United States because we're playing against pros and we don't have pros yet. We have a couple college kids and some high school kids. And she's like, just be ready because this is hard. And I don't know that I really appreciated that until I was there in person. And it was hard. I mean, we, we almost, I think we like almost lost to, I think we lost to Canada in pool play. And then we almost lost to China in the like medal rounds. And then we fought our way all the way to the gold medal game and we beat Spain um, you know, who we typically see a lot in the mm -hmm. gold medal games. And um, I just remember how relieved I felt and realizing that going from being an assistant coach on this team to a head coach on this team was very, very different. Like the amount of stress and this whole feeling that this country is relying on you, um, not, don't let them down. Um, and so I remember a really strong feeling of elation as the head coach of that team and be, being able to accomplish what we did. I was fortunate to have Brianna Stewart as the MVP as a young high school player on that team. So I had, was blessed with great players, but it taught me a lot about how good the international basketball is. And so when I had a chance to start working with the national team, I really think that it was an advantage for me to have been in that experience, knowing how hard it was going to be and how hard we would have to work to prepare. Okay. Now, how much time do you spend in practices on fast breaks and shooting? Um, Probably last year, not enough. We were very young and new last year. So we probably spent a little bit more time on our half court offense and our defense than we should have next year. I, I would like to spend at least 50% of my practice on transition drills and shooting. And I think it's because I want to be good at it. You know, I, I think you have to decide as a coach, what do you want to be good at? 
if you want to be good at, at, at shooting and transition, then work on it more. If you want to be good at pressing and defense, then work on it more. Next year, I want to be good at our, our transition. And because we were implementing the Princeton offense for the first time really last year, uh, we spent a lot more time on it than I would like. So I think we'll probably start every practice with shooting drills, transition drills. We will incorporate um, transition offense and defense into our first half of practice. Um, and we need to really, uh, the biggest thing for us is teaching our kids to play fast without turning it over. And we're not going to be able to get good at that if we don't practice it a lot. So I, I would like to say next year, I would like to be somewhere between 33 and 50% working on uh, fast pace shooting and offense. Okay. Albert Sprott has asked, can the Princeton offense be effective when you have short players? Yes, 100%. Um, I think the, the middle spot in the Princeton offense, the five spot is really, really important. If you have somebody who can pass it and shoot it, then you can, you can run anybody in that spot. They don't even need to be a post player. Um, so that's what I like about it is that you, you really can spread the floor. Um, we have options that I didn't get into where we'll step our five player out as well. And so we might, you know, cut, cut our first player to the basket, you know, flare our second player, and then immediately step that five player from the free throw line area all the way out to the top of the key. And so now you're talking about five out offense which I think is really effective with a small team. And we see that a lot with teams. I mean, I'm thinking about even uh, as recently as, as last fall when we played Puerto Rico, you know, we, we, we had to guard a team that was, had five guards at times on the floor. Um, we played Japan. Um, they play like a five out offense. And so you have to have post players that can defend on the perimeter and you have to figure out how to take advantage of your size. So that's what I like about it is if you want to play small, you can get into a five out set out of it. You can step your five player out and, and you can use back cuts. Um, you can use ball screens. You can use staggers. Um, and if you want to take advantage of a post up isolation, you just need to be able to put your, the player that you want in that four spot. And it can, again, it can be a guard, it can be a wing, it can be a post, but you put them in that four spot and run that, that ISO post play and you can post them up against anybody. Okay. Tim Trott has asked, how do you rate the Princeton, Princeton offense with other offenses like the triangle offense, read and react? Um, where would you rate? Yeah. Um, I think it, you know, all of it depends on the, personnel that you have. When I was in college, we, we ran the triangle offense. Um, but I also, I had six, eight Carol Walters and six, four Rebecca Lobo and six feet, but Jamel Elliott. So we had three very skilled post players. And when you have a dominant center, the triangle offense works great. And Kara was a dominant center. And when Kara came out, Rebecca could go in and be a dominant center. But when Kara was in, Rebecca could also shoot the three and pass from the high post and step out to the three-point line. So we were, we were really, really good in the triangle offense. Now, when I, when, when I got into coaching, <laughs> I've never seen a 6'8 player in any of the programs that I've coached. Um, so until I got to the national team and coached uh, uh, Brittany Griner, I didn't see anybody over 6'2". So I had to be more creative in the offenses that I use. So, so I've liked to use more of the Princeton offense or a five out offense at the schools that I've coached at because I've had small, smaller and more versatile post players. And the thing that I like about the Princeton offense is that you can utilize it to suit your, your personnel. So last year we utilized it a lot to get into high low situations. And then the year before we used it a lot to get into five out situations. So you can morph it into being the offense that you need it to be for your team. And so that's why I rate it highly is that it flows. Um, it creates create, uh, a versatility within your program if you recruit the right way. And I think it suits a lot of different styles when you don't have a dominant 6'5 post player. Now Cassius Humphrey wants to know, could this offense work with the 1-2-2 two, two defense? Yes. Actually, it, it, any of the options that you want to use, what, what, whether it's as long as the ball gets to the mid post area. So if you again, you have a five player that can really pass, um, understand spacing and cut to the right spots. Um, you can use this offense, whether they screen uh, on the wing, whether they're cutting. Uh, we tell our team every time somebody cuts hard to the basket, we should have a three point opportunity in the zone. So if you can get your get the ball to the free throw line or under area 
against any zone, one, two, two, or a two, three, if you can get the ball right under the free throw line to your five player and you cut a, anybody to the basket, you should either get a layup or you should get a wide open three off of a skip. Um, and so I, I think it really spreads out a one, two, two offense, a one, two, two defense really well. Now, how do you, um, what defines success on the court for you? Uh, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think that it, 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 you know, I, I tell my team all the time that obviously we want to win. I mean, you know, we're in this to win. We, you know, we're, we're measured by wins and losses as, as coaches. And I get that, but uh, I tell my team all the time that if somebody were to walk in the gym the very first time, like they've never seen us play and they couldn't see the scoreboard for whatever reason, um, they didn't know what the score was and they were just watching us play. Like, what do you want them to see? What do you want them to see about you? What, how would you want them to leave the, the impression that they have when they leave the gym? I, what, what do you want that to be? And so we talk a lot about um, success looking like um, teamwork and success looking like excitement and celebration of each other um, and, and outworking your opponent. So if at the end of the day, you outwork somebody and you play, you play better than them and you lose, I, I'm, I feel good about that. And my team knows that there are times where I come in the locker room and I'm pissed after we win. And then there's times where I come in and I'm fine after we lose, because I want to be proud of the way that my team plays hard, how they represent themselves and how they treat each other. I want them to have good sportsmanship. I want them to be competitive, but I want them to be um, fair. You know, I want them to understand what it means to be able to be competitive, but still act the right way as a role model for young people. Albert Sprott has asked, do you emphasize more on offense than defense or how do you like split it up? Yeah. Um, it, it, again, it depends on the year. If we have a, a more veteran team, we'll spend a little bit more time on offense. Um, if we have a younger team, we may 50-50, we may split it. Uh, I would say it probably, probably breaks down for me at least down to 60-40, uh, 60 offense and 40 defense. Um, again, next year, I'm, I'm hoping that because we have a more veteran team, we can spend more time on transition offense and less time on defense. Um, but I, I, I think that it's important when your offense isn't working that you can really sit down and guard people. So um, I've had a lot of success in my career uh, just having a lot of guys that are invested on the defensive end. So we, we certainly spend a lot of time making sure our guys are prepared. Now, obviously, all your players are home right now. Um, how are you helping them prepare for the season, even though we're in quarantine? Yeah. That's a hard one. I mean, this is rare for us. Um, typically, we'd be sending them home mid-May uh, with a summer workout program and ant anticipating them being back in July. Um, you know, this year we sent them home in March and we probably won't see them until almost September. So it could be five, six month um, sabbatical, I guess, from us. <laughs> um, so we, we have stayed in touch. We, we do weekly meetings, um, sometimes more um, during April, we spent time watching film with them, try and prepare them for the summer of how to watch film on their own. Um, we send them workouts through our strength coach. Uh, and then we encourage them to kind of hold each other accountable for the conditioning piece. Uh, a lot of our student athletes don't have access to a gym right now. So our uh, priority has just been making sure that they're mentally feeling healthy um, you know, being away from their friends and some of them being trapped at home for this long has been t difficult. Um, when you add, you know, the, the turmoil that's going on in the United States right now, um, for, especially for some of my younger black athletes, it's been a really tough week. And so we want to make sure they're doing okay. We want to make sure they're health, you know, healthy mentally, that they feel okay, that they're supported from afar, um, that they're supporting each other. Um, and that as we get into the summer and gyms start to open up and they can start to do basketball workouts, we'll get more, uh, we'll, we'll be a little bit more um, adamant about them getting into the gym. But right now it's just making sure that they feel supported, that academically they're doing well, and that they, they feel like their, their coaches are there for them from afar. That's great. Um, Cassius Humphrey has asked, if you have a small team, what's the best defense or what's your go-to defense? If you know, you, you know, the odds height wise are stacked yeah. against you? Uh, probably full court man, to be honest with you. Um, 
I feel like you can, you know, defense is about toughness. So you can pretty much put any tough team into anything. And I, we definitely have had teams where we've had to play some zone um, just to kind of protect and be disruptive. But my man to man is definitely my go to. And if I have really tough, scrappy players, then I'll make them pick up full court. And that's another thing I love about international basketball. Even when I'm recruiting and I'm watching kids play, I love when they like they score and they just turn around and they pick up the ball. Like there's a competitive drive to wanting to be a player that can really set the tone defensively on both ends of the floor. And if you want to protect the basket and you don't have a big person to do that, then take as much time as you can off of the shot clock before that team can get into a half court offense. So whether it's a slow down press um, or you just pick up full court, don't let the point guard, you know, be the primary ball handler. I think you can be creative in how you uh, be disruptive on the defensive end when you have a small scrappy team, you just have to have them invested in, you know, fronting or doubling or whatever you're going to do in the post and then having guys that are willing to, to box out and, you know, run through a wall for you. So some of my favorite teams have been my smaller scrappy teams. Now, Damon Sullivan wants to know, are there any specific zone offenses that your team plays when they do play zone? Yeah. Uh, zone offenses or zone? I mean, defense, defense. sorry, defense, defense. Uh, yeah, we, we, we played a lot of three, two this year. So kind of a one, two, two, uh, uh, quarter court, um, where we would put a bigger player at the top. Um, you know, our, our emphasis is to keep the ball out of, out of the middle, like where I've been stressing to get the ball all night. That's where we really want to keep the ball out of in our zone. So we'll put one of our more athletic long players at the top of our three, two. Um, and then, you know, you need to have post players that will get out to your corners, but, um, and then by the end of the year, we were, you know, trying to get to the point where we could trap out of that in the corners and also on the wings. Um, you can be creative in how you guard ball screens out of a three, two. So, um, I, I really like the three, two defense. We, we've played a two, three in the past too. So depending on if you have a, if you have a bigger post player that can't really move well, and you want to keep them in the middle and you want to protect them, I really like a two, three. Uh, Tim Trot has asked how much time is spent during practice on the breakdown of drills. Yeah. Um, and then what, at what point do you start to get into the competitions? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, that's probably something we argue about uh, the most on our staff. <laughs> one of my assistants wants to do a lot more breakdowns. So, um, I would say we try and make it fairly even because as we get into the season, we don't want to necessarily be playing five on five a lot. Um, so if we can break something down for 15 to 20 minutes, uh, like maybe two to three different components of our offense. So it could be off the elbow. It could be the flare screen. It could be the post option. Uh, it could be the middle ball screen roll rise. Um, you know, trying to maybe pick two op options that we want to work on for 15 to 20 minutes. And then when we, when we then go into our five on five segment, we'll incorporate those breakdowns into the offense that we run. Um, so I would say it's fairly even because we're not trying to necessarily scrimmage for a long time, maybe 15 to 20 minutes of breakdowns and then, then maybe 15 to 20 minutes of up and down competition, depending on the time of year. Damon Sullivan wants to know, how do you make uh, training competitive? Um, well, I think that you have to uh, at, at least – you know, one of the things that I try to offer is that I was a player, right? And so one of the things that I felt like that kept me competitive as an athlete was when things weren't the same every day, you know, and some coaches like to do the same thing every day, same drills, same way to warm up, um, same formats of practice. And I get that there's, you know, some continuity in that, but as an athlete, like if you kind of always know what's coming, you can kind of zone it out. So I like to kind of change it up for my, my athletes. And, and obviously you have to get in, whether it's like, we got to do a rebounding drill pretty much every day. We got to do a shooting drill, but we try and change it up. We try not to have like, like the same repetitive drills every single day in practice. And then we try and, and break them up into teams where they can be competitive. And it's not always like starters versus non-starters. We'll mix the teams up. Um, we try and keep score. If we're doing a shooting drill, it might be that they're competing against the clock. If we're doing like our, our gold team versus our blue team, it may be that we're keeping score. If we want to um, emphasize something, so let's say we want to emphasize screening, 
we may decide that we're not going to give points to any of the teams that don't score unless they set a great screen in the offense. If we want to emphasize rebounding, then maybe the scoring is just every time you get a rebound. So we'll sometimes make the drills competitive based on what the emphasis of that drill is. So if we want to score in transition, maybe we give them a bonus point if they score within the ten, first 10 seconds. If we're focused on execution, we give them a bonus point if they execute well. So I think letting them know what, what your emphasis is for that day um, and giving them a goal, whether it's to beat the other team or to beat the clock or whoever gets to this score first, or we started last year to do drills where we, were, we told them they had to get a score, a stop, and a score before they could finish. And so they have a goal in their mind because these kids are competitive. They want to win. So you kind of have to dangle that carrot in front of them a lot. On defense, does your team do a lot of trapping the ball in the corner? Or are you looking to trap a lot? We don't. Um, I think, uh, again, it depends on the kind of team that you have. Next year, we'll be a little bit smaller and more athletic. So we probably will look to do that a little bit more. Again, now that our defense and our offensive foundations are in and implemented, we'll be able to be more um, aggressive and creative about what we do off of both ends. Are rankings important for you as you look at prospective players for, at GW? No. <laughs> um, you know, they, they just don't matter. You know, you, have, you just have kids that are, like, not ranked that end up being some of the better players in the country, and you have kids that are ranked that are, end up being busts. So, you know, it might just be a guideline sometimes for some schools that they have to check those kids out. But uh, for us, it's more about finding kids that fit who we are I think GW is a unique university um, where we, you know, we're really trying to recruit high level academic kids. Um, we want high character people. So, I, you know, I'd rather look for a kid that's a better fit for me than, than fight for a kid that's ranked higher. Okay. Now, who, who, is, who are some of your mentors that you um, can go to for advice or if you're looking for anything really? Yeah. Well, they, you know, Gino's always been my number one mentor. Um, you know, obviously I played for him in college, so I was fortunate to be able to be taught the game the way that he sees it. And I'm sure a lot of people on this call have heard him speak or watched him coach or at least seen his teams that he's coached. And um, I just think that he's uh, really, really good at utilizing his personnel well. He's really, really good at motivating his players to want to be at their very best. Um, I also feel like in my, in my youth, uh, when I first started coaching, I probably asked them more questions about scenarios that happened off the floor than I did coaching. And so to, for him to be a resource to me as like, how do I handle a scenario where a kid is doing this or saying that and have him know that he would be there for me was really, really important. Um, as I've continued through my coaching career, I have a lot more colleagues that are friends and, and people that I can respect in the game. Uh, and I just feel really, really lucky. I mean, I called, um, you know, Lynn Roberts out at Utah this year in the middle of the season because I was, you know, really frustrated with my team and I wanted to get her take on something. And I've been able to work closely with um, coaches like Corey Close and um, with through our, our coaches association and Courtney Banghart at UNC and Trisha Cullup at Toledo. And so um, having a, a close knit group of like really successful, strong women has been good for me in the last, you know, four or five years of my career since I moved from Hartford onto GW. So I feel very lucky. Now, do you teach toughness or do players just develop that over the years? Mm. I wish I could teach it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, it's one of those hard ones for me. I think you have to sometimes recruit it a little bit. Um, teach it a little bit, uh, celebrate it, value it. Um, it has to be something that's important in your program. If you value it, if you point it out all the time, you, usually we have kids that want to please you. And so if they want attention and they want to have the coach be, you know, there, there for them and, and, and celebrate them, then they're, they're going to do the things that you value the most. And toughness is definitely something that we value in our program. So I think it can be taught by valuing it, but it's also nice when you, when you just have it and you recruit it. Now, Dale Carrington wants to know, what do you consider to be a balanced team? Um, 
Well, I think um, I'm biased, but I think it starts with your point guard. <laughs> um, I think you have to have somebody who's willing to be the set the tone and be the leader um, physically, emotionally, mentally, verbally. Uh, it's hard to find. But I think that you know, when you have a good team, you have a point guard that's just all in, that they're your extension of you on the floor and they – um, you know, they want to do what you ask of them, but they also, tr you trust them to, to lead the team the way that they see is best fit. Um, I like to have two or three guys that can really knock down the three point shot. Um, it's, it's nice when you have more than that, but if you can, if you want to be balanced, you have to be able to spread the floor. Um, you have to have a stretch four. you have to have a, a, a knockdown shooter from the two spot, and you've got to even have some other wings that can, can at least be respected from the three point line. Um, I think you need to have a slasher. I think you need to have somebody who can score the ball, create their own shot, score in transition, get you offensive rebounds, um, and just be somebody that's dynamic for you on the wing. Um, and then, I, you know, I think it depends on where you are. You know, post players are, again, it's something that you can, you can, you can decide to coach based on how, you, how your post players play. And you can coach based on their strengths. So you don't have to have a really dominant low block player to be a balanced team if you feel like you can play in a different way. And so, again, our championship team in 2018, we didn't have a dominant low post player. Our best post player was our three. We had a really athletic four, and we had another stretch, stretch post player that could shoot the three. We were very, very balanced. If you do have a, a, a dominant low post player, then you need to surround them with players that can pass and shoot. So I think your post position is, is sometimes a little more dependent on what you have available to you. I think that's a great gem to end on. Uh, we appreciate <laughs> you, Jen, and thank yeah. you, um, FIBA Americas, for having us. We would like to thank all the participants, national federations, and WABC on today's virtual Coaches Clinic series. We hope that everyone had a great time and learned from this wonderful experience. We thank everyone again for participating, and thank you again, Jen, for being a part of our Coaches Clinic. Thank you, Grady. Thanks, everybody, for listening. I appreciate it. Thank you, Coach. Take care. All right. Okay, bye.